Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe. If you recall from the last tutorial, we got to the point where we had this double buffer graphics implemented and we're just painting blue to the screen right now, but it's really nice because we have this graphics handle here, which is passed to this abstract method. So we don't have to worry about the window or anything. We can just draw to the screen and have faith that it will work. In this tutorial, what we're going to be going over is the entity component system or ECS. You may have heard this term and I feel like you probably think it's a little bit more complicated than it really is. So what is Entity Component System? According to Wikipedia, Entity Component System is an architectural pattern that's used mostly in game development. ECS follows the composition over inheritance principle that allows greater flexibility in defining entities where every object in game scene is an entity. Enemies, bullets, vehicles, etc. Every entity consists of one or more components which add behavior or functionality. Therefore, the behavior of an entity can be changed at runtime by adding or removing components. Okay, this may sound confusing, but it's actually quite simple. Let's draw out some things that we can really down what entity component system is because this is going to be an important concept in our game engine since it's the way that we will be updating and having the flexibility that we need in our game engine. So let's find out how this works in a little bit greater detail. Once again, what is entity component system? You may have seen this in Unity and other games, and it is a concept that is actually quite simple, but I feel like it can get overloaded and seem like something more complex than it is. The way we will be using it in our game is basically we will have an object. So say this object is our player, um, our little geometry dash player. What we're gonna have is instead of having one entity, the player, that we update once so we just call an update function on him and then he has all sorts of different things uh just built into the one big player class and then you would end up having this player class that ends up having okay well we need his velocity we need his uh boundaries we need all this different stuff and then the list goes on and on and before you know it you have this giant monolithic class which is really hard to keep track of and you don't quite know what's going on so in order to allow more flexibility, we can abstract that away. So let's say we have this player class. Um, what things does this player class have? Well, we know that this player class is going to, he, he has a box bounce, right? Because we need something to determine where his boundaries are so that we can figure out if he's colliding with other things. Well, what else does the player class have? Well, he has a rigid body because he is a physics object. And we need to update him, his speed, and everything accordingly. And that is all encapsulated in the rigid body. What else does he have? Well, he has a player script. And this player script is in charge of uh, figuring out which input moves him and everything like that. Uh, what other things might he have? Well, he could have a sprite class, okay? And this sprite class is in charge of determining what uh, he is showing. So, like, what pictures is he showing? Is he, what colors is he? Um, and so then the list can go on and on, and then you just have all these different components that are all part of this one entity, the player. And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually separate these out so that it's strictly separated. We are not going to have these uh, coupled where the player has all these built into one big player, player class like up here. Instead, what it will be is we'll have a game object class, which will consist of it will have a list of components, okay? Every single one of these components could be any of these things above. And each of these components will have their own update method. Each of these components will have their own draw method. And then we can use these components and instead of updating the player once, what we do is when we say update a game object, it goes through this list of components and then it updates every single one of those components and calls the update function on them. And so this way we just have a strict decoupling, which makes it easier if we ever need to change things. And then we can also reuse a lot of these and not have to worry about whether it's what it's attached to. We can just use them as it is and it's in charge of itself and nothing else. Now that we know what the entity component system is, let's actually try and code this. So let's go into our packages here. And also let's rename this real quick. I just realized this should be com.jade and we just named this package jade. So if we go into here and then hit refactor, rename, we can say com.jade and then it will package it under the same thing. And then let's do the same thing with this one. We'll refactor, rename, 
then we'll say com.util. Okay, where should this uh, game object class live? I think it should live as one of the core components of this engine because it is a pretty core piece of any engine. You want this game object class. And then we'll just create a new class called game object. Okay, and let's sort of define what we want this game object class to have, what kind of behaviors we want. So we definitely know we're going to want a list of components. And these components will be, like I said, those uh, very abstract ideas of just things that you can attach to a game object that have an update method and a draw method. And then we'll just call this the components. And let's make this private. And then it says, where is this coming from? And we don't have a component class. So let's go into here real quick and we'll create one more class. We will call this component. And then let's make this an abstract class. And this abstract class will have two abstract methods for now. We'll say public abstract void update. And let's actually give it an implementation too. And we'll just say for now, um, it does absolutely nothing. And let's actually, we'll take the abstract out of this. So each component is going to have the method built in that does nothing. That way, if you don't want to override it, you don't have to. But if you do want to override it, you have the ability to. And then we'll see what that means as we go and create some com components too. And then we'll say public void draw graphics 2D G2. And this one will do nothing for now too. And then let's go up here and just change that to graphics 2D. Okay. So now we have the component class. Let's go back to our game object class. We have this list and it's saying it can't find that. So hit alt enter and it will import the list. So what are other something, what are some other things that we're going to want? Well, we might want for debugging purposes, a name attached to this game object. So just some name that you come up with, which will be helpful if you ever need to debug something. Okay. And then let's create a constructor, which will take in a name and it will take in a transform. Okay. And what is the transform? Well, every game object needs a position. You can't have a game object without having position. That is something that is inherent and is not necessarily a component. So we're going to encapsulate this in this thing called a transform. And let's go into here and we'll create a new package. We will call this com dot. Uh, we'll call it data structure because these are sort of the structures that we'll be using. I can't really come up with a better name for this. And then we'll create a new class and we will call this transform. Okay. And then let's also come up with one more class. Um, we will put this actually in the util and we'll call this vector two. And this will be our own vector class, which will be helpful for other things too. A vector two is just simply, um, it looks like this. You have an X and you have a Y. That's all it is. It, it just encapsulates that. So we'll have a public, float x and y and then when someone wants to create a vector 2 they will just pass in a float and we'll say this dot x equals x and this dot y equals y so very simple and you literally just call these directly from it and then let's go to the transform the transform for now is only going to have a vector 2 and this is going to be the position and we'll hit alt enter to import that and then a public transform will take in a vector two and this is going to be the position we'll just say this dot position equals position and the reason we're encapsulating this in a thing called transform and not just calling this position is because transform can also contain a vector two for scale and a vector two for rotation so basically this just holds the information about the position of the object, the scale of the object and the rotation of the object. For now, we're not going to be doing anything with these two. We're just going to be worrying about position. Okay. Back to game object class now. So now that we have this transform, let's import this and then we will go into here and let's go up here actually too. And we will create a public transform transform. So this is just the transform of the object. And then we'll say this dot name equals name, this dot transform equals transform. And then we'll say components, this dot components equals a new array list. So we're just initializing, initializing this to an empty array list. And then what other methods are we going to want? If you've ever used unity, you know that they have this neat feature called get component and you just pass the class of the component you're trying to get 
and then you get that component. This is something similar that we're going to want in our engine too, so it makes it really easy to get the different components attached to this game object. So we will actually try and create that in just a second. But before we do, I just want to create an actual game object so that we can see what is happening. So let's go into our level editor scene. And then up here, we will say, let's create a game object here. And we'll just call this a test OBJ for a test object. And then inside of our init function, we'll say test OBJ equals a new game object. And this takes in the name. So we will say um, some game object and then a transform. So we'll say a new transform and this takes in a new vector too. And we'll say 0.0F, 0.0F. There we go. And then we're going to need to import these two. So we'll import that and we will import that. Okay. And then you can sort of see that it's about to go off the edge, but it should be good. And then, so now we have this test object and then inside the update method, what we'll do is we will call test object dot update DT. And so this means that every game object is going to need an update method. So let's go back to this game object class, scroll down to here, and then we'll have a public void update double DT for Delta time. And then this is going to be in charge of updating the object. For now, let's just say system.out.print the name, so this.name, plus, and then we'll say um, the transform. And then let's create a two string method for the transform so that we can print it out nicely because this will be helpful. Uh, and I forgot plus there. Uh, whenever you're debugging everything, it's a lot easier to just say print this instead of actually having to say like print this.transform.position dot x okay so let's go to our transform and this is just a standard java thing too if you've ever programmed in java then you know that you can do at override with a class and then you can say public string to string and this is a method built into all object classes that will convert a object to string whenever you concatenate it with a string like this or something like that and it just implicitly calls this function so when we want to print a transform for now what we'll do is we'll just say return position and then we'll do a open parenthesis plus position dot x plus comma position dot y plus close parenthesis and that should be good for position then if we go back to our game object this is all fine if we go to our level editor scene this is all fine I'll go back here one more time and then when I run this we're going to see after it finishes compiling. There we go. We get a null pointer. <laughs> okay, so it's never actually calling the initialization function that we made. We forgot to add that. So we see here that it is calling super.scene here, but we never included a call to init inside of our super. So let's go to our scene abstract class. And then inside of the constructor, we'll say this.name equals name. And then we will call init. And that should be good. So let's go back and then we may have to go here and then just implement this so that we don't get any errors with that. And then this one will just be empty. So then if we go back to our level editor scene and run this one more time, we should be good. There we go. And then we see that we get some game object position zero, zero, which is exactly what we would expect because we named it some game object and gave it a position of zero, zero. So that's all working good. And then, like I said, it just, makes this really nice uh, whenever you go to print out um, inside this game object class. Whenever you go to print out this transform, it just converts it to this, which is nice. Okay, so next let's create a get component function. So how do we want this to work? Well, the way I would like it to work is basically you say um, you want a component returned and you'd say get component and you give it some class and then it returns the first component of that class that is inside this object. So in Java, this is a little bit weird. I did have to do some stack overflow to figure out how to get this working correct. Um, so we would make this abstract because we, we need to return an abstract class. This isn't, we don't know what class is going to be returned at runtime. So we do a open uh, angle bracket and we say T extends component. So we're saying we want an abstract type of component. 
and then we're going to say t is going to be the return type and then get component and we're going to be taking in a class of type t which is an abstract component class and this will be the component class then what we can do is we can loop over all the components so we'll say for component c in components if component class dot is assignable from so if this com if this component class is assignable from the class that we are currently on the current components class so if these two have the same class is basically what this is saying from except this is a little bit better because if it's an abstract class then this will also return that they're technically the same class which is nice because we may be needing that in the future as well so if this component class is assignable from this components class then we want to return or we actually want to try because uh, this is could throw an exception so we'll say try return component class dot cast c and so all this is doing is it's casting it to the type of this class so that we get the uh, exact type that we were looking for and then we'll say catch a class cast exception e and then we'll just say e dot print stack trace and then we'll exit with a negative one to indicate that we had a problem so if it can't find it or if it does find something, but then it fails in trying to cast it, then it will just uh, print the stack trace and say something failed when we tried to do this. We should never get to this point. Um, this should only ever be entered if it actually is assignable from, and then the cast should be successful. So what happens if we don't find one? Well, we just return null. And this will be our indicator to be like, okay, there was no object that we found inside this game object of that class. Let's go back to component because we do need to do a little bit more work with this to make sure that it is overridable and abstract enough to make any type of class this. So we want to make this uh, a generic class as well so that any class can override this and be a type of component. So we'll just give it the little angle brackets and say T and this means that it is basically just a generic class. And then inside here, we'll just put a couple returns just so that we know we're purposely doing nothing in these methods okay let's get a concrete component so that we can sort of see how this all works because i know it is very hard to wrap your mind around but it's really nice and it really does make a lot of sense once we begin to use this okay so let's create a new package and we will call this components so this will hold all of our different components and let's just create, um, we'll say box bounds, because this is going to be a component that we will need eventually. And then what we're going to say is this extends component, which is a generic class. And then we'll hit Alt Enter to import that. And then what we can do is inside here, we'll say at override, and then we'll say public void, whoops, update double delta time. So we will just have an update method and then this says method does not override from its super class um, and so let's go to component real quick and we forgot to put double delta time in there so that's kind of important too so we'll have that in there and then this should be good now cool and then let's just print out a line real quick we will say we are inside the box bounds and this will just indicate that we have gotten that all right and everything okay so let's go to our game object class and add one more little thing to our update method. So every time we update the game object class, what we'll want to do is we'll actually want to say for every component that we have and components for component C inside of all the components, let's just call C.update DT. That way, instead of updating the object, what we're doing is we just update all the components and that's actually sort of what controls the game object itself. To our level editor scene, and inside of our init function, so we have this, and then we'll just say test obj dot, and now we realize that we need another thing. So we have get component, but we should actually have something else called add component, and then we'll say new box bounds. That way we can add a new component. So let's go back into our component class, and or our game object class. And then we'll add one more method. This one's a little bit, this, well, it's much easier than get component because you don't have to worry about what type it is. So we'll just say 
public void add component. And then this will take in a component class uh, C. And then we'll just say components dot add C. And I forgot an S there. There we go, components dot add C. So that should be all good. Let's go back to our level editor scene. So now we have no error here. It's updating. And so theoretically, since this is a part of this object now, when we call update on this object, it should call that line. So let's hit shift F10 to run this. And sure enough, we get we are inside the box bounds. Now let's illustrate just one more thing. So inside box bounds, let's go back up here. Let's create a constructor real quick. We'll say public uh, box bounds and we'll take in just a string for now. We'll call it name. This is temporary. We're going to get rid of this too. So we'll say string name equals, well, string name. And we'll just say this dot name equals name. And let's go back to our level editor scene and then pass in just um, box. So now this box has a name called box bounds. Um, and this is a public string so that we can access it. Let's go back into level editor scene. Now let's say we want to get this component and do some work on it. We should be able to say test obj dot get component. And then we'll say box bounds dot class and then dot name and notice how it's already auto completing it knows what we're doing and it says it's not a statement let's print this out so we'll say system dot out dot print line so we should be printing the name of this box bounds which is box and then let's go back into here real quick take out this print and then we'll just keep that as it is let's hit shift f10 we should see box being printed out here now and sure enough, we get box printed out a million times. So we know for sure everything is working correctly. And now we have this system where we can create a game object, which has a transform, which contains a position. And then we can add these abstract components, which can hold whatever data you want. And then you can update one game object, which ends up updating all of the components attached to it. And then you can also get a specific component and do whatever you want with that component call functions on it whatever you want this is going to be the basis for this entire game engine it's really useful a really important concept um, i really suggest if my explanations were not good leave a comment tell me that i need to add another video just sort of explaining this a little bit more in depth but this is going to be the basis of our game engine and in the next tutorial what we're going to do is we're actually going to start using this component to create a sprite class, which we will use to load in sprite sheets and stuff. And actually before that, we'll have to create this thing called an asset pool. And I will go over what all that is in just a moment in the next tutorial. Okay guys, I hope you liked this. If you did, please hit like and subscribe and I will see you in the next tutorial. Thanks, see ya.